Good morning, my friends. Again, we're uh, glad to have you with us as we spend some time together in God's Word, learning about some neat things here. And uh, just have a quick question for you. How confident are you when you make a promise to someone that you will keep it? Does it matter who you've made the promise to? Or do you think it's more dependent on you, on your resolve, on your character? You know, we're going to look at that in a little bit. But, uh, you know, we, we have, I left you last week with probably one of the most sad accounts in the Bible, at, at least as far as, as, as I can see, you know, uh, the betrayal of Jesus by Judas Iscariot. You know, it, I just, I could teach you all over again on this, but it, it just, it boggles my mind how an individual could be that close could be living with Jesus for three years or a little better than three years and see all of his miracles and talk with them and see Jesus' heart and still deny him. Still, more, more than deny him, sell him off for 30 pieces of silver. And it, you know, it, it reminds me too of, of other, other people, you know, and I've seen with, with young people, you know, they have good solid Christian homes and yet raised in a good church and get a little bit older and decide to leave all that and, and live for the world, you know, live for money or live for whatever other than God. I've seen, you know, other, other even just adults, not, not kids, but adults that, that seem to have it together, you know, and serving God and, and throw it away, you know, and you wonder what is going on. You know, but, but anyway, that, that's, that's not what I, what I want to teach on this, this, this morning. We, we looked at Judas last week, but as, as that happens, all right, and, and, we, and we see that in, in Mark chapter 14, grab your Bibles and flip there if you will, while I keep talking here, but we, we're going to carry on, and that, that's, that's where we left off, and I do want to, want to point out one thing. It, it can be very difficult as we look at um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and we see, uh, you know, especially the last week of Jesus' life, you know, and, and more in, in, in here we're looking at the last day, to try to get the events in the order that they happen. Um, it, it's, it really seems that, you know, to, the New Testament writers were not so much concerned about the chronological order as they were each small individual event that happened, all right? The message behind each of those events was more important. And, and you know, we, we look in our, our day and age, we're used to looking at watching movies or something like that, and we, and we kind of expect to see everything as it, as it transpired. And they don't seem to be concerned with that, all right? You know, and, you know, they didn't have smartphones. They didn't have smart watches. They didn't have even day timers. That's a paper one, in case you don't know what that is. You know, but, but they didn't have that. And, and I don't think that time was that necessarily as important to them, but, but, but what they wanted, they, they just wanted to get these important events and details to us. And the order, it's difficult to try to place it all in order. And really, I want to focus on what these individual events were. And we looked at the one last week of, of Judas, again, betraying Jesus, all right, and, 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 and so forth. And we, and we move in now. I, I, um, I just want to take a look at, at verse number 22. We're going to actually look at verses 22 down to verse 31, and you're going to wonder, why are we going to stop partway through this one little thing here, you know? But bear with me. There's just some things that I, I think it's important for us to, to look at and to understand. Excuse me. Mark chapter 14 and verse 22, all right? It says, and as they did eat. So it gives us a little time stamp there. It's during the meal, okay? But and as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it and gave to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. All right, so as, as they were there, you, you can call it whatever you wish. If, if you want to call it the Lord's table, if you want to call it the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, the communion, it, it really doesn't matter. Those terms, those titles are things that we've given to it. And I don't believe they're anywhere in here. And I, you can find it for me and correct me here. But my, my point is this, it, it's Jesus was teaching them something here. And these are, are two elements that were common at most meals. All right, they, they would have uh, bread and they would have grape juice, all right, or, or fruit of the vine, as it's called here. And we're going to look at that in, in, in just a little bit here. But in specific here, because it was the Passover time, the bread is unleavened bread, 
all right? What that is, it has no yeast in it, it hasn't been allowed to rise at all, and, and it's important that you, you understand that throughout, throughout the Bible, in Leviticus and on through the Bible, leaven is always used as a picture of sin, okay? So hence, when Jesus is using this bread and breaking it and saying, this is my body, Jesus didn't have any sin. So it's important that the bread, although the, the Passover, that they, they had to have unleavened bread, it's important also in the picture that Jesus is making, he doesn't have any sin in him. And that's why it is unleavened bread. We go to great extents when we have uh, um, the Lord's table at, in our church to make sure that we have unleavened bread. We just don't go and buy some saltines and, and throw them on the, on the plate there. It's unleavened bread that we use. Because that's what Jesus used here in the picture. And I think it's important when, he, when something is specific here that we stick with what is there. Okay. Now, this bread that, that Jesus takes here and, and breaks, it does not magically become Jesus' body. It is a representation of Jesus' body. That false doctrine called transubstantiation is where they think, well, this actually becomes Jesus' body. I am not a cannibal, all right? I like meat, but I am not going to eat somebody else, and especially not Jesus, all right? And that, that's not what it's talking about. It is something that represents Jesus' body as it's broken. Now, point to note here is his body was not, his bones were never broken, okay? But his body was pierced, so it was broken by being pierced and being beaten and, and so forth, but no bones were ever broken. But the body is broken here. It says, this is my body which is broken, broken to the point of it dies, okay? That's broken, dead is broken, all right? And, but it, it's, it's a simple, object lesson that Jesus is using here. And Jesus used object lessons all the time. We see that, you know, in his parables and in other things that he's just trying to teach, you know, he would you know, talk about the plants, he would talk about whatever is, is there and use that to teach and to show what he is trying to say. And he used the same thing here, although with this one, it's a little bit different. He gives this, this object lesson of this bread and this, this uh, fruit of the vine, for, that represents his blood, but, but he does something else here. Like, again, it's important that we look at other passages and compare scripture with scripture so we get the whole picture. Mark just records a little bit here. He says, take heat, this is my body. But if you keep your finger in Mark, we're coming right back there, and you go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this is the passage that we generally read and, and, and look at when we are um, taking part in the Lord's table. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 24, it says, And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. All right, so it, it's, it's important here. This is a command that Jesus, he says, do this in remembrance of what I am going to do. All right, which the disciples still didn't clue in on, but we're going to see some other, other things here. So we, as it moves on, okay, let's look at verse 23 down to verse 25, and it says, And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. All right? Now, just want to take off on a little segue here for just a second here. And we notice here that it says, Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine. If you look at the parallel passage in Matthew, just jot this reference down, because it's, it's this, this particular event that is happening here is recorded in Matthew 26, Mark 14, and Luke 22. All right, and in Matthew 26 and verse 29, what's in the cup is called the fruit of the vine in Mark uh, 1425, as we've just read here, what's in the cup is called the fruit of the vine. In Luke 22, verse 18, it is called the fruit of the vine. If we look in, in if you still got your finger in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 25, it just refers to it as he does here when he says, and he took the cup. He just refers to the cup. Never in any of these things is it ever referred to as wine. Now, just to clarify things here, and, and, and I'm not going to get into a great deal, the, the, the whole idea of, of alcohol versus non-alcohol and, and so forth is not the point of, 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 this, uh, of this lesson that we're looking at here. But wine is sometimes used in the Bible referring to alcoholic wine. We know that Noah, when he came out of the ark, you know, he grew the vineyard, he, he had some wine and he got drunk. That's 
that's alcoholic wine. But it is also used, same, sometimes when it just says the word wine, it is referring to non-alcoholic wine, grape juice, all right, in essence, or new wine, all right? And it is the fruit of the vine. They would go to great lengths. Now, they, they did make alcoholic wine, no, 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 doubt about, no doubt about it. But they also went to great lengths to preserve the fruit of the vine so that it did not ferment. And they could do that by keeping it cool, putting it in containers under, under, you know, in, in a, under running water, like in a brook somewhere, would keep it down to a certain temperature. Or they could take it and they could boil it down and, and take most of the moisture content out so it ends up being like a syrup, similar to what we put in our, in our fountain drinks at, you go to Wendy's, you know, all the, all the Diet Coke, you know, and, and, and there's a syrup that goes in and then the carbonated water. Well, they didn't have carbonated water back then, at least I don't think they did, but they, they would take this, this condensed down, boiled down syrup that they had, called must actually, but I mean, there's other things that, are, that is called must as well, but they would, they would take this and they would mix it in with water and they would have some fresh grape juice if you can call that fresh grape juice coming from a concentrate. But at any rate, they would have that and it would be preserved, all right? And so they went to great lengths. They were, it wasn't just, some people think, well, they, everybody drank wine. They were plastered all the time. That's not the case, all right? That is not the case. They went to great lengths. Some of the people went to great lengths to have fresh grape juice and not alcoholic wine, okay? But there's more here. As, as we see here in, in uh, Mark chapter four here, or 14 rather, in verse number 25, okay, there, there's, there's something else that is special here. It says, Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. You know what that means? That after we go to heaven, we are going to eat, all right? That's great news for Baptists. Reminds me of a little story of a kindergarten teacher. And she said to her kids, you know, I'd like you to bring something tomorrow for show and tell that tells us a little about who, about who you are, all right? So these three kids came with some things the next day, and she says, oh, that's wonderful. Some people have come for our show and tell time. And she, she turns to the first one, his name is Ben. And she says, Ben, come on up here. And he says, what well, she says, what do you have? And he says, I have a Star of David because I am Jewish. Oh, that's wonderful, Ben. Thank you. you. You can sit down. And there's a little girl there, and her name is Mary. Now, Mary, come on up here. And she says, what do you have, Mary? And Mary says, I have a rosary because I am a Catholic. The teacher goes, oh, okay, thank you. You can sit down. And there's another little boy named Johnny. She says, Johnny, come on up here. What do you have? And he says, I have a casserole because I'm a Baptist. All right, We like to eat. But at any rate, that's just, just uh, me being silly here. But I, I want you to see something here. In, in, this, in this passage here that, that talks in, in um, Mark chapter 14 here, this is the blood of the New Testament, verse 24, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will not drink of it. Uh, uh, I will, uh, let me back up, back up, 23. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And we look at the parallel passage of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 25. And I want to see something here. It says, after the same manner also, he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. We need to do it to remember what he has done. He's commanding us. This object lesson is different than the object lesson of the wheat and the tares or, or you know, the ten talents and all, all that because this object lesson, he wants us to repeat, all right? He wants us to do this to remember. He's commanding to do this so that we will remember the sacrifice that Jesus gave and what he did on the cross for us, all right? This is a blessed picture of what he has done. But the, the, the question here is, 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 is when we look at um, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 26, I want, I want, you, I want you to see this here. Um, it says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. How often is often? How often are we to do that? Now, it doesn't say how seldom can we do it. So, you know, I know there's, there's some people that think, well, we should only do it once a year. Well, that's, to me, that's like, that's, that's too seldom to me. And I, maybe I'm wrong, okay? But it doesn't also mean that, you know, we can only, we have to do this on 
you know, the third Sunday of every month, okay? It is not to be a ritual, but it is something that, that should be done at, at a frequent enough pace that it is held in a, in a, in a special way to uh, remember what Jesus has done, but not to a point where if it, if it gets to a ritual, you're doing something wrong, okay? And maybe the, the amount of times you're doing might be wrong or whatever it is, okay? It is not a ritual. It is not a special magic spell that we're going to do, okay? It, it, is not, it is not necessary for salvation. It is, it, it, it is just a command that Jesus says, I want you to do this so you can remember what I've done. Should we only remember that once a year? I don't think so, okay? But I, 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 I think that, you know, we need to put this in, in, into some kind of a perspective here to understand that he says, as oft as you do this, in remembrance of me, okay? And what he did is a special thing. But, you know, I, I, wanna, I wanna really focus today, and I always spend half our time looking at this part, but it, it, it moves into what I really wanna focus on is verses 26 down to verse 31, all right? So as, as we look at that, let's, let's read Mark 14, 26 to 31, and it says, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out unto the Mount of Olives. I'm just gonna stop there for a second. Wouldn't it be neat to hear Jesus sing? Have you ever thought about that? Again, I want to time travel back and just jump in that room and, and hear Jesus sing. But, uh, excuse me, can't do that. So anyway, they sang a hymn and they went out. And as they're going along, and again, here's, here's where it, 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 you need to understand. There's, there's a lot of things that happen here, okay? After they leave and they go, there's, there's I believe it's John 14, 15, 16, 17, all this, this discussion that happens. It's not just a, a quick little discussion and boom, they're, they're at. There's a lot of things that, that, that take place during this time, I believe, all right? And, uh, but at any rate, I want to look at this one particular event that Jesus talks about here. He says, And Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. And that is, he's actually quoting Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 7. Let me read the whole verse for you. He's just quoting a, a portion of it. It says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow. Saith the Lord of hosts, smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. All right. So we, we have... Um, <clears throat> Let me, let me just look at what, what Jesus is saying here. He says, All shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. Now, I want to make a little correction on something that I said last week. Um, when I was doing my little digging into what room is that, that they're in, and you may remember we, we talked a bit about that, and I said that it's, it's more than likely I, I believe this is what I said, that it's more than likely this room that they had for the upper room is the same place that, that Jesus came back to and, you know, and appeared to them. That is not the case, all right? It says right here, but after that I am risen, in verse 28, I will go before you into Galilee, all right? So it, it might be possible that they, they stayed there and that's where, you know, when, when they, the ladies came back to get them and they ran from there, they may have been there, but you know what? If that's the case, they weren't being obedient because they were supposed to go back to Galilee. But so much of what Jesus is telling them here seems to go over the disciples' heads. They don't understand that Jesus is about to die, all right? And even though he said, I'm going to die, and, and it's still just not clicking in, all right? But I just, just wanted to, to correct that and, and emphasize more the fact that here I am digging into trying to figure out whose house this is. It didn't matter whose house it was. It was a person that wanted to be used of God, and Jesus got to to use that house and these people got to let Jesus use their house for this last supper part, okay? But at any rate, just, just to correct what I'd said, I don't want to give you some wrong information and you know that was just me kind of being, you know, thinking and, and thinking that it might be. It, it was definitely not once we get looking at the scripture, all right? So even when we come up with some ideas, it, we got to balance it with scripture and Jesus was going to, when he, Jesus met with them, when he went into that upper room, it's a different upper room okay, than the one in Jerusalem where they had the, the Last Supper. It is definitely a different upper room because this one is in Galilee, okay? But anyway, that's not the point here. Here we are. All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. But after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said unto him, although all shall be offended, yet will not I. I will not be offended. All right. 
Was Peter just talking out of his hat? Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. Do you think he meant it? Do you think he meant it? Look what Jesus says next. Verse 30. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee. Remember, Peter's the guy who's always going to blurt out. Okay? Jesus says something. There's Peter. Just going to blast it out there. Not me. Not me. Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even in this night, before the cock... Let me, let me just clarify something here. When cock... This day, their day started, okay, at um, supper time. Okay? Here we go. Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. Their, their day didn't go from midnight to midnight, okay? It was that dinner time, all right? But anyway, that's, that's not point here. It says, this day, even in this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. But he spake the more vehemently, if I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. And then it says, likewise said they all, all right? After Peter said this, Peter says, it doesn't matter what happens. I don't care who else turns on against you. I will die for you. Let me ask you, was Peter saying this to impress Jesus or to impress the others? Or did he really mean it? Did he mean it? I want you to look at verse 43. It says, And immediately, while he yet spake, cometh Judas, talking about Jesus, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and scribes and the elders. There's a great multitude with, with swords and staves, all right? And there they are, okay? And we, we see here, what was, what was Peter going to do? What was Peter going to do? Matthew, Mark, and Luke all say basically the same thing here, all right? In verse 47, it says, And one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. One of them. That's what it says in Matthew. That's what it says in Mark. That's what it says in Luke. But in John, we find another little detail, which is why it's important that we look at all the passages. In John chapter 18, and verse 10, it says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear, and the servant's name was Malchus. How determined was Jesus to not deny his Lord? He said, If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Was he serious? He knew it. He knew it. This, there was no possible way that he was ever going to deny his Lord. He is willing to take on a whole army. All these guys, a great multitude with swords and staves. And there's Peter. Whew! Out comes a sword. I'll take his all on. You're not taking my God. You're not taking my Lord. All right. And to show you how skilled he is with his sword, he winds up to kill somebody, and he cuts off his ear. You know why? He would have done more damage if he'd had a fishing pole, because he's used to that. Fishing with nets, fishing. He did fish with a fishing pole, all right? They all know he just fished with nets. Ah, but remember when Jesus says, we're going to pay our taxes, so Peter, you go down with a hook, you catch a fish, look in his mouth. You know, I've, I've, I've done a fair bit of fishing, and I've looked in a lot of fish's mouths, I've yet to find even a loony in there. Well, they had enough to pay their taxes. Whew. You imagine finding enough to pay your taxes in a fish's mouth? But anyway, no. Nope. It's Peter fish with a pole, and he fished with a net. He didn't have more damage to that guy with a fishing pole because that's what he's had the skills with. But you know what? He knew, all right? He knew that he would, that, that he thought he knew. He thought he knew. And, and there he is. Did he mean what he said, that he would die? Absolutely. Absolutely, with all his heart, I believe that Peter was ready to die for Jesus. And he says, I will not deny you. Did he, was he blowing smoke? No. Peter meant it with all his heart. There he is. I'll take on a whole army with something I have no business holding. And I'll take him on. Because I'm not going to deny you. All right? He knew or he thought he knew. How well do we know ourselves? How well? 
you know, and as, as I was studying this out and, and going through my concordance and, and other, you know, uh, chain references and so forth, I come across a verse, oh, that is a fantastic verse. But I was just reminded of this verse. Because I'll, I'll tell you why, because I'm, I'm looking at this thing, but that is a great verse. I don't remember that verse. You know, I, I've read my Bible dozens of times through cover to cover, okay? But I don't remember this verse ever jumping out at me like this. Let me read you the verse. Micah. Is that good stuff in these in minor prophets? Yeah, Micah chapter 6 in verse 8. So I grab my Bible, the Bible that I use every day to, to read from. It's, it's not the one that I preach from. It's not the one that I teach from. It's not the one that I take to church. It's starting to get loose pages, because so I, I just I just leave it next to my chair, and, and that's that's where I read my Bible every day. So I go go through my, you know, I, I look this up, you know, I, I can't remember where, if I, if I pulled it up on a, on a word search or whatever, or it might have been, in, I think it was a cross-reference in my, in my Bible there, so I'm, I'm going to flip back to this verse, Micah. It was underlined. <laughs> it meant something special, but I'd forgotten. It's, it's what happens to us. But in Michael, Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, it says, he hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. What does it mean to walk humbly with thy God? It's to recognize what we are before him. And understand that. In, in Psalm 103 and verse 14, it says, He knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. God knows what we are, what we're made of, but do we know? Do we know? Do we think we are, excuse me, more than dust? God remembers, but so often we don't. You say, that will never happen to me. Or I'll never do that particular sin. It won't get me. There's no way I will ever do that. Ever do that. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. Flip over there if you would. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Considering thyself, meekness is humble gentleness. It, it is like when I was a firefighter, we would practice ice and water rescue. Okay, now if someone falls through the water, the last thing you do is walk out there, falls through the ice rather, into the water. You don't walk out there because you will go through as well. It is, it is you, you need to, if, if you have to go out there, okay, well, the, the, you need to take, what, what it's saying here is you need to take every precaution because you may fall into there too. Same as with, with uh, the ice and water. It was, it, you either talk, try to talk them into, you know, get up and roll, on, roll across the ice. You know, if you can pull yourself out, you know, it, worst case scenario, you know, if, you, if you're falling in there, you get your hands and you let them freeze to the ice so it'll hold you up, okay? Just, just a little tip for you. But we, we would talk. If you, can't, if you can't talk them in, you would reach something for them, a pull there. If that doesn't work, you can throw something to them. The last thing you want to do is go out there. Okay, that's what you have to do. You're spread out on that ice. Okay, it's, it's spreading out as much weight as you can. And we would go practice this and cut holes in the ice and jump in. And it's minus 30 out, and we're playing in the water. Okay, but we would. It, the the point is, is that you got to make sure that you aren't going to fall in there. And it's the same here. What, what we're talking about in Galatians chapter one: Be careful, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou be tempted. Like you're going to fall through that ice. Okay, consider yourself. All right? Consider yourself taking every precaution because you aren't what you think you are. We aren't what we think we are. God knows we're dust. We don't. You know? Come with me to Romans chapter 12. This is a powerful chapter. So often we stop with Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. I beseech therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God and so forth. But I want to take a look at verse 3. Okay? For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Now in, in context, this is, is, is starting a passage on scriptural 
uh, spiritual rather gifts that people have. But it continues on that it goes down. There's also after a few verses of spiritual gifts, it, it goes on to a, a list of tr- what a true Christian should be. And, and to think, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think soberly, soberly, and, and according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. That's what it says in verse 3. But go down to verse 9. It says, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another, putting them, putting others above ourselves and recognizing what we are. We're not above them, okay? The same as what it says there, you know, do not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. We need to put others ahead of us, all right? And remember this, we're dust. We're dust. God loves this dust, but we're dust. You know, Peter was willing to die for Jesus. He knew in his heart, he knew there was no way in the world he could possibly deny his Lord. He knew that. And yet, as we'll see, not years later, not months later, not even days later, but just a few hours later, he denies him under the threat of a young girl. Here's a whole army with swords and staves, and he is ready to charge in there with something he had no business holding, a sword, and yet a young girl, and he denies Jesus. You know, you know what's even a better part of this story? Is Jesus is willing to forgive Peter, and he did forgive Peter. We're going to look next week, maybe next week, I'm not sure, when Jesus looks at Peter, and that, that passage there brings tears to my eyes when I think of what conversation happened without any words, of when Jesus turns and looks at Peter as Peter has denied Jesus the third time and the cock crows and he looks up, and somehow or other, whether Jesus is walking from one place to another, as, as far as being escorted from, you know, going back and forth to Herod, to, to Pilate, and so forth, or wherever he was going, whether it was that, or whether Jesus, Peter could see from where he was when, when Jesus was being beaten, I don't know. But there was a place where they were apart, but they could, he could see Jesus. And as that cock crowed, Jesus turned and looked directly at Peter. And they made eye contact, and that broke Peter's heart. All right? But it, it's, it's this. It, I'm, this is affecting me right now. It's what I was supposed to do. But, but, you know, Jesus was willing to forgive Peter. And, you know, when we see a brother or sister in, in a sin or in trouble, remember this. Don't look down on that person because in a few hours, you could be in that same place. What, what did Peter do? It was just a few short hours from I'll die with you to I don't know who he is to a young girl. What threat is a young girl? Just a few hours. We need to remember that. We could be there not a year from now. We could be there in a few hours. You may be positive. You may be absolutely sure and ready with a sword in your hand and all alone ready to take on a great multitude. But in a few short hours, Satan could sift you as wheat, Jesus says. And we could fall through that ice just like that person in in the ice and water rescue, just like a weak brother or sister fell. Let me read this verse one more time in Micah chapter 6, verse 8. I think you should underline it in your Bible. It's a powerful verse. And you come back to it someday and remember, boy, that is a good verse. And he has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? Shows us what we should do What should we do? We should live justly. What should be our motivation? To love mercy. How should we walk? We should walk humbly. And where should our confidence be in? Not in me. My confidence should be in God. And what doth the Lord require of thee? But to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. 
we serve a great God. Our trust needs to be in Him because our trust in us is thin ice. Have a great day.